Hi, my name's Jill and I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> First of all, I want to thank the committee for asking me to share, here, uh, share my story here today. I always consider it a pleasure and an honor to share what this phenomenal program has done in my life. I am a PE teacher at San Diego High and I just finished teaching PE, so I'm going to have you do a little physical activity before I get into sharing my story. I'm going to sing a song for you. And when I sing a word that has the letter B in it, I'd like you to stand up. And if you're standing up and I say a letter B again, I'd like you to sit down. Okay? Everybody got it? Yeah. All right. Here we go. My Bonnie lies over the ocean. My Bonnie lies over the sea. My Bonnie lies over the ocean. So bring back my Bonnie to me. Bring back, bring back, bring back my Bonnie to me. Bring back. Bring back, bring back my Bonnie to me. Very good, very good. And just as I expected, there were the perfectionists who were going up and down every single time, didn't miss a beat. There were those who were not paying attention to the directions and just looked around and did what everybody else was doing. And then there were those who said, I ain't doing any of this because this, uh, this is not what I came here to hear. And it's not what I came here to do. Okay. So anyway, I was born in Cleveland, Ohio on September 29th, 1966. The very first thing my father said to my mother was, you got your girl, but she's a crippled. I was born with a club foot. It made my mother cry. And I think from the very first time I took my first breath, I felt like there was something wrong with me. I have four brothers I always wanted to be a part of, but it was always, go home, you're a girl, we don't want you. And of course, I would follow a little bit behind trying to catch them doing something wrong. So when I did, I could say, ooh, I'm going to tell mom. They're like, okay, if you, I prom if, you guys, if you promise not to tell, you can hang out with us. I'm like, yes. At the age of five, we moved to an 87-acre farm outside of Bowling Green in Pemberville, Ohio, where I had horses, cows, dogs, pigs, sheep, you name it. And in fourth grade, I got in a fight, fight with my best friend. And she was most popular and I was second popular. And I was called Fatty Four Eyes and the Goodyear Blimp for three months of the remaining year of fourth grade, and I did not have a single friend. That is when teachers played a very important role in my life. And I thought maybe one day I'll be a teacher because my teacher helped me out a lot. And I am still friends with my fourth grade teacher on Facebook, so that there is a good thing in that. Anyway, when I was seven years old, I was sexually abused by a friend of my older brother, but, and I thought there was something wrong with me. I thought it was my fault, and I thought for sure at the age of seven I was going to hell. See, I grew up in a family that every Sunday, no matter what, we went to church. And there was one bathroom for all of us. So it was me, my four brothers, my mom and dad for one bathroom. So there was a lot of arguing and yelling and fighting and complaining every morning, especially Sunday mornings on our way, because we needed to get to church on time. You got this? And we get out of the car, and as soon as we got out of the car, the smiles went on, everybody was nice to each other, praise the Lord, how you doing today? This is a wonderful day, isn't it? And then we'd go home, and we'd argue and fight and yell the whole rest of the week. It made no sense to me why we were only nice to people in public. And there's one thing that I love about the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. It is not a religion. Religion is man-made. Spirituality is God-given. Religion causes the world to have wars. Spirituality causes the world to hold hands. See, I've, I've been in places where I've seen people get kicked out of churches because they love the wrong person. And that's what I love the, about the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. It's all inclusive. You know what? Just come as you are. We love you as you are. And anyway, after the blizzard of 78, my mom said, that's it, we are moving to Florida. So, all expense pay, I mean, my, to end this meeting saying, 
I love you. I believe in you. God loves you. God believes in you. And just for kicks, I'd like to end this class like I end my PE classes. No, it's no more exercise, I promise. I'm going to say a few lines, and I'd like you to repeat after me. I'm awesome. I'm, awesome. I'm, beautiful. I'm beautiful. I'm confident. I'm, confident. I'm, determined. I'm determined. I can do anything I put my mind to. Now turn to the person next to you and say you love them. Thanks for letting me share. paid trip to Florida. Of course, my parents were paying for it. Went to Florida, and I remember my father saying, we're going to a better place. There is no crying. No crying. Even though we were leaving all our animals behind and everything I knew. And I was like, okay. And it was always, if, are you crying? I'll give you something to cry about. And of course, off came the belt. The only emotion I really saw demonstrated in my family growing up was anger. Anger was very popular, and I realized for me, if I needed to cry, I'd stuff it, stuff it, stuff it. And in the, being sober, one of the best gifts I've received in sobriety is the gift of my tears. Anyway, we moved down to Florida, and because I was on a farm, very much a tomboy, very much looked like a boy, everybody would say, I, I would introduce myself to, hello, my name is Jill, I'm a girl, I'm not a boy. Because Jill is very similar to Joe. You know, what's your name? Jill, Joe, Jill, Joe. Okay, no, Jill, I'm a girl, I'm not a boy. And, you know, around the holidays, I can remember an aunt of mine, my father's sister, told me at a very young age, you know your father never wanted a girl, don't you? That is such a wonderful thing to say to a little kid that your father never wanted you. And I embrace that to be true. I embraced that to be true, so I had that in the back of my mind. And that same aunt at a holiday, when I was getting ready to have a, a brownie, a second brownie, she said, go ahead and have it. You're going to be fat, just like the rest of us shanks. And I made a conscious decision that I will never be fat, because I already was called Fatty Four Eyes in the Goodyear blimp in, in elementary school, and that was very hurtful. And what people don't realize is that they say sticks and stones will break your bones, but names will never hurt you. And that is the biggest lie there is. Names hurt. Punch me, stab me, shoot me, and my body will heal in six months. Say something that hurts my spirit. I may go to the grave still wounded from what you said to me. It's amazing how this tongue can be so powerful to lift people up and build people up and inspire people, but it can also destroy people's dreams and, and make people want to end their lives. So anyway, I had this idea in my head that my father didn't want me. And when we moved down to Florida, my father was the football coach of an all-guys football team. And I, looked, I went to watch one of the practices, and I looked at my dad, and I went, Dad, can I try out? He goes, it's all guys. I go, I don't care. It's all guys. I'll try out. I could, I could compete with them. So I was the first girl in the state of Florida to play Pop Warner football with the helmet and the shoulder pads, and they called me JJ for Jill the Jock because they didn't want them to know, the other team to know that I was a girl, but the other team always knew I was a girl. So up until this point, you know, drugs, drinking had nothing in it, and not even a part of my life. I think if I think about it, my first drug of choice probably was food, sugar, and it was very comforting for me. When I was 15 years old in high school, all my friends, because I got, I got 14 varsity letters in high school, all my friends were much older. So my parents were going out of town for a weekend, and I'm goody two-twos, don't drink, don't smoke, don't do anything, I just play sports, and just play sports and play sports. That, that was another drug of choice, sports, and competing. And so my parents said, sure, no problem. I invite a couple friends over. I start with a big thing of 
Seagram 7, I mean 7 and 7. It was disgusting and I could not understand how a liquid could affect my brain. And then we started playing quarters with three shot glasses of Seagram 7. And my friends were not finishing it, so I was finishing it for them. Mm. The next thing I knew, I came to in my bed the next morning. I was all full of throw up. I said, who threw up in my bed and how did I get these clothes on? Well, you threw up in your bed. You were so full of throw up, we had to throw you in the shower. You fell in the pool six times, and I was hung over for three days. I had the world's worst bed spins. I wish somebody would have told me back then, just put your foot on the floor, it will stop spinning. No, I had to suffer through it with my legs on the bed completely, and I'm just spinning around. And I swore I would never drink again. And I didn't for about six months. And then I was introduced to beer. Oh, I didn't like the taste of it, but boy, when I drank that, I knew a new freedom and a new happiness. I got taller, my boobs got bigger, my moves got better, and I had it going on, and it did something for me. And I was like, yes, I have the answer. Whatever this does, I want this. And I love this because you know what? It made me feel like I belonged anywhere. And it worked for a while. It did. I had some good times for a short period of time. Because what was always happening was I was the life of the party. And then on the way home, on the way home, I started contemplating suicide. On the way home, I started thinking, how can I end my life? On my way home, all I could think about is how much I hate myself and can I go to bed and not ever wake up? See, I still felt like I didn't belong in my family, even though I tried so hard by outside things. You know, straight A's, all these things. My parents threw me in my first rehab when I was a junior in high school. Straight Incorporated, and it was very devastating to me. But I knew in there, this, eh, I may be an alcoholic, but then in 1983, I was in, introduced to my first Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. And it was in Indian Rocks Beach, Florida. I walked in the room, Okay, I was young back then. That was, 19, that was a long time ago, and everybody in Florida seems to all have gray hair still now. So I looked around the room, and everybody was old, but I noticed the laughter in the rooms. So I immediately went back to the room and checked out the coffee. I thought, you know what? There's no way that people are laughing without a drink in their hand. And sure enough, the seed of Alcoholics Anonymous was planted. But just like a seed, it needs to go into the ground, and it needs to go to a dark, cold place and be broken. And there needs to be a lot of water or a lot of tears. And you know, I wasn't ready yet, but I was introduced to AA, and I knew, I knew that someday, maybe I would actually get this program. And basically, from the age of 15 to 24, I was on a suicide mission. Drink, get drunk try and commit suicide, go for an ambulance ride, end up in an emergency room, going, how, how did I get here? You know, I got five athletic scholarships, drank them all away. In fact, in one college in North Carolina, I thought, what I need to do is get away from my family, you know, geographics. Get away from my family. I'm going to go to a small college in North Carolina where it's Christian college. Nobody drinks that are Christian. Nobody, you know, so there's no way. So I'm going to not drink, not smoke, not overeat and throw up. I'm going I'm to be perfect. I go to college, and I don't know what it is about alcoholics, but I can go in a room, and I can look around, and there may be only three major partiers in the room that like to drink. And we would find each other. Hey, what are you doing tonight? I don't know, what are you doing? Want to go to the movies? Sure. Yeah, right, go to the movies. You know, we go to the next town over to buy alcohol and get drunk. And anyway, in that, in that college, one day I was flipping a friend in the snow, and I cut my leg, and they put me on muscle relaxers. Now, I hadn't kind of known in the back of my mind that I was an alcoholic. Well, that night, it was supposed to last me for two weeks. That night... I thought, what would happen if I added alcohol to these muscle relaxers? And sure enough, I took the whole bottle of muscle relaxers on top of 18 beers, and I ended up giving some guy a black eye, ended up, came to an emergency room, and a friend of mine had tried to slice his wrists, and he was in the emergency room also. 
And we looked at each other and went, what are you doing? And he's like, what am I doing? What are you doing? It didn't make sense that both of us wanted to help the other person, but un each one of us didn't care about ourselves. See, one of the most challenging tests that we will pass in this life is being able to look in the mirror and see our best friend, see someone that we love and care about. And for the longest time, I tried to get away from that person. And I have news for you. Everywhere you go, there you are. You go to the bathroom, you're there. You take a shower, you're there. You can't get away from you. And I don't know if you've ever been on a blind date with someone you don't like. Well, back in the olden days, they didn't have cell phones to get out of the situation. Okay, nowadays you could say, hey, can you call me? Can, can you let me know how this is going. No, back in the olden days, it wasn't like that. You know, so it's like, imagine yourself on a blind date with some of you, I mean, just doesn't smell good, doesn't look good. I mean, you are just, ooh, okay. And you look at your clock and only two minutes have gone by and you have to have be there for two hours, okay. That seems like crazy. Oh, what we would have done to have cell phones back then. And then now, when you're with someone you enjoy that are beautiful and just touch your heart and soul and you look down at your clock, two hours went by and it felt like two minutes. So imagine living in a body, which I did for a long time, that I despised and I hated. When I was 15, I got into competitive bodybuilding, and I really tried to, I did diet really, really well and hard, and my brother said, why are you dieting so hard? After the first competition, I went behind the scenes, and there was all these goodies, you know, cake, cookies, donuts, everything. I was so full after the competition, my brother said, why don't you throw up? And I went, that is disgusting. That is gross. But I did. And it was a great relief. And I, too, became addicted to eating and throwing up. And I was throwing up up to eight times that summer every day. In fact, there was a period of three years I kept nothing in my system. And because I am very much black or white, I mean, even I wear a zebra, black and white, I'm very much a black or white thinker, it was either all or nothing. That means I was eating healthy, working out, going to school, doing the right thing, because if I'd screw up in one area, I wanted to screw up in every area. And I had this guy, he was like my dad in AA, and he would tell me, Jill, just put down the alcohol first. Everything else, the eating, the smoking, whatever else will come in line. And he also told me, I want you to think of something. When you think about picking up that drink, I want you to imagine you're at the bar. They, they had bars with pay phones in the back in the olden days. There wasn't. It, it, at the, I'm at the bar, and he goes, put everything up there that means so much to you. And I go, what do you mean? He goes, put your family, put your friends, put your ability to walk, your ability to talk, your ability to go to the bathroom by yourself, your freedom, all up there on the bar. Because you are gambling all of that for this drink. And I went, no. He goes, yes, you are. You don't know, and I don't know, when I pick up a drink, when a drink goes past these lips, I have no idea what's going to happen. I have no idea if I'm going to control it this time or not. And I went in and out. My first meeting was in 1983. My sobriety date, by the grace of God, is February 5th, 1994. But I'm telling you, in and out, in and out, in and out. It took me a whole year to stay sober on a Friday night. Monday through Friday, AA meetings. Friday night, drunk. Saturday night, drunk. Sunday, drunk. Monday, come in, cry, pick up a white t surrender token. I have enough to pave my driveway. And they're like... Who's least likely to get this program of Alcoholics Anonymous? There's no way Jill's going to get this. There's no way. There was no way I was going to get this program. And you know what? I didn't get it. I came here and I prayed for the willingness to want to get it. It's not my job to change me. It's my job to be willing to change, and then God changes me. And what is change? Change. Constantly having adjustments needing God every day, or gratitude. I'm weird, I like acronym, acronyms and all that stuff. I love that kind of stuff. And I realized that, you know what? After so many suicide attempts, you know, I'm at the University of Tampa. I failed a makeup trigonometry test, okay? This is someone who likes to get straight A's. 
I failed a makeup test. And I went, that's it? Because for the longest time, I went to the classroom eight to three. From three to five, I was at volleyball practice. From six to midnight, I was waitressing. From uh, midnight to three, I'd be studying. Then I'd do the same thing over again. And I went, forget it. I'm just going to go drink. And you know, when you're younger, you ask somebody older to buy alcohol for you when you're not of age. You just stand, hey, you want to get me some alcohol? Sure, you know, you could take a few. And I got my car and I drove, went somewhere. All I know is at 8 p.m. in the evening that night, okay, I have no recollection from 8.30 in the morning to 8 at night. Apparently, I got in my car and drove and I was going 80 miles an hour in a 40 mile an hour zone. I hit the back end of a semi, I flipped over three lanes of traffic. I flew out of the car, car hit a tree, caught on fire. I was three yards from the road, three yards from the tree on, in my car on fire, and I landed flat on my back. And I heard people come over, should we move her? Is she dead? What's going on? I don't know. Apparently, I got up and started walking to college. And they said, hey, where are you going, lady? And I said, I'm going to go sleep off my buzz before volleyball practice. And they said, excuse me, young lady, you need to either go to the hospital or you're going to jail. And I went, where's the ambulance? And then in the, even in the hospital at 7 o'clock at night, the, the nurse goes, hey, doctor, there goes, your, there goes your patient. Where are you going? I'm going to go sleep off my buzz before volleyball practice. I was determined to get to volleyball practice. And it was... You would have thought that would have stopped me from drinking and driving. No, I was drinking and riding my bicycle, drunk and hitting parked cars, and saying, oh, it's my contact. Oh, it's my contact. And then at that same college at University of Tampa, I was in New Orleans, and I used to like to drink, and then I used to like to think. You know, my father never wanted me. I was sexually abused. You know, I loved that playing those tapes over and over. It creates such a positive life. And so I wanted to go for a walk. We were on the eighth floor of a hotel building. And they wouldn't let me out of the hotel building. So I hung, I hung over. I went, there's a balcony and a balcony and a balcony. I ran, boom, jump. Went to the next one. Boom. My coach goes, you better stop right there. Oh, yeah. What am I supposed to stop and say I fell in from four floors up? No, I didn't. I kept on going. I went all the way down. I ended up getting tackled by a classmate. But can you believe because of my behavior under the influence of alcohol, they took away my athletic scholarship because I was not a good example to the athletic team. How could they just really take that away? And now that they took my athletic scholarship away, what better thing to do than get a job at the cafeteria to feed my other addiction? So anyway, in 1991, my father told me to go try out for this game show, American Gladiators. I had no idea what it was. Over 3,000 people tried out and I was one of 12 to be picked. It was an all expense paid trip to California and I knew when I was getting on that plane I was gonna come out to California and get clean and sober for the last time or come up, come, go back in a body bag. See, that was the all or nothing kind of thinking. My father, never, my father told me growing up, you don't wanna be a teacher, there's no money in it. I came out to California, I got my teaching credential. <laughs> do we do that with our parents? What's funny is the older I get, the more I realize my parents were right in a lot of things, which really sucks, but anyway. <laughs> I came out here, and in 1991, like I said, I was on American Gladiators. I lost by four seconds in the Eliminator to the girl who went to the finals. And two, they gave me the ticket two weeks before. And I went to AA meetings, and I gave some people the tickets in AA meetings. I should have said, I need you to be there to support me. I need your support. But here's what I did, because my wonderful, great self-esteem back then was, oh, if you have something else to do, I understand, don't worry about it. Not one person showed up to support me because they had other things to do. I lost. I went behind the scenes. First of all, the cameras are like this close, and you're supposed to pretend like they're not there, which is very hard to not pretend like something's right here. I went behind the scenes of the curtain, and I just broke down crying. And I went, you're such a loser. You're no good. I can't believe you're such a loser. Because I come from such a competitive family. It's all about winning, 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 bringing home the W. And I was ashamed. And I thought, I'm going to go to Jerry's Deli, where everybody hangs out afterwards, and see if I see any friends in AA. And I didn't see anyone. So I went and bought one beer. 
and then one 12 pack. And then I went and got a whole bunch of food. And it was not a very good experience because I didn't realize how strong some of the other gladiators are, if you know what I mean. And I got myself in a very bad situation. But I got, the, I got away from my family. And as much as I love my family, sometimes family has a way of pushing our buttons. And family has a way, they can't make us drink, but they could sure make us thirsty. And my family made me really thirsty. And so that's why I needed to come out and get away from my family to get to know who I am. You know, I lost five athletic scholarships, got kicked out of two colleges, went through four alcohol and drug treatment centers. But since I've been out in California, I was on American Gladiators. In 1997, I played women's professional baseball. In 2000, I played women's professional football. You know, I have done a lot of these things. I've achieved a lot of these things. I got these certificates because it was all about achievement, because that's how I used to get my self-esteem. If I did this, you'll love me. If I do this, you'll love me. And it's interesting. Now that I love me, none of that stuff even matters. And it's funny because when I came to the rooms like this, I wanted all you guys to like me so much. I wanted you to go, man, she was phenomenal, she was great. But now that I love me, I don't need your approval anymore. It's so crazy how that works. I mean, don't get me wrong, I like it, but I'm just saying, it's, it's interesting to realize that, you know, they always said to me, you can't love others until you learn to love yourself. And I was like, forget that, I love other people and I hate myself. I would do anything for anybody else. I'd give the shirt off my back for somebody else before I take care of myself. And I've learned in these rooms that I need to take care of me first. If I don't take care of me first, and I'm going to tell you, it's, it's the nightly news and the morning news. AM news, news PM. News, nutrition, exercise, water, sleep. AM is Alcoholics Anonymous meetings. PM is prayer and meditation. I need to take care of these things because I am, yes, I'm a spiritual being, but I'm having a physical experience. And I don't know about you guys, but when I don't feel well, I don't want to pray. I don't want to go to meetings. I don't want to do anything. So that means I need to take care of my physical body first. I, and, and I had to learn how to say no because I was such a people pleaser, especially when it came to authority figures. Oh, yeah, I could do that. Oh, yeah, I could do that. I could do that. My first year teaching at Our Lady of Malibu School, <laughs> Our Lady of Malibu, yes, there is such a place called Our Lady of Malibu. I taught first grade in the morning, K-8, P-E in the afternoon, seventh and eighth grade science. I coached five out of six sports. I was the athletics director. I was in charge of the science fair. I was the school nurse and the youth group leader. <sighs> <laughs> I did not know how to say no. Today, when my principal asked me to do something, I say, I'm sorry, no, no, I'm, I'm sorry. You know, I've, I've done all that. So it's interesting, but I've learned so much in these rooms. And what I realized a long time ago was because I was such a perfectionist, and it upset me very greatly when I did my fifth step to realize that perfectionism is a character defect. I had no idea. I thought it was something good. I thought if everybody was perfectionist, this world would be such a great place. No, if everybody was a perfectionist, we would all be miserable because no one is perfect. So I strive for excellence today. But before, I used to strive for perfection. So here's what I would do. Okay, I want to do it perfect. Mm, I know I can't do it perfect, so I'll procrastinate. And then I'll procrastinate to a point where I just get almost paralyzed and do nothing. This is a program of action, not a program of thinking. I did not know that I could act my way into good thinking. I thought I had to think positive before I could act positive. No, I could act as if I'm positive, act as if I care about you, act as if, you know, I could I act these things and eventually I start to feel these things. It's crazy how this thing actually works. They say, fake it till you make it, one day at a time, just do it, put one foot in front of the other, do the next indicated thing. You know, wouldn't it be great if we were going through a situation and we knew what to do? Like we could say, God, 
I really need to know what to do in this situation. Can you please, please, please help me? Excuse me, my phone's vibrating. But I don't know how because it's on airplane mode. Hold on. God? Seriously. Are you kidding me? You mean good orderly direction? Gift of desperation? Gratitude or death? Good old dad? The great outdoors? And your favorite? Group of drunks? I love it. Yes, okay, I got you. Yes, you know I'm speaking. Okay. All right. Okay. Love you too. Bye. <laughs> Whoa, that's trippy. Look at that. It's on airplane mode. Can you imagine? But here's what he wanted me to tell you, each and every one in here. God loves you. And God's proud of you. And he told me to say, you know how he knows he's working in your life? You're all still here. We're all still here. And speaking of about a God shot, you know, one of the things I used to say is, I'll drink tomorrow. I'll stay sober today, but I'll get drunk tomorrow. It works really well unless you're in Australia. <laughs> and in, when I was 30 years old, I went to Australia on this, with this tour group, singles tour group, and they made drinking really fun again, looking really good. And I, like I said, I relapsed. I went in and out for 12 years, and I used to keep a list of things that I'm going to drink next, all the new inventions. You know, next time I drink, I got to try this and this and this, because I relapsed so much. It's like, what the heck, you know? And so I was on this island making a list, especially in Australia, and I went, God, I really need a meeting. I really need a meeting. Knowing there's not going to be an a meeting out on this island at all. It's only the bar and restaurant and where we slept, and that's it. And I'm hiking down this path, tormenting whether or not I'm going to drink or not, like we do before we con are convinced that we're completely alcoholics and are very thoroughly have done a first step. Because once we are really done a first step, drinking is no longer an option. We go to the next thing. And I'm, I'm walking. I was still debating back and forth. There's this gentleman walking towards me in a path, and he has his shirt open, and he has the Alcoholics Anonymous symbol around his neck. And I said, are you a friend of Bill's? And he said, yes, I am. And I said, I need a meeting. And he goes, we meet my wife tonight at the restaurant, and we'll have a meeting. See, that's how God works. If 50% of me wants to drink and 50% of me wants to get drunk, if I throw up that prayer, God, please help me, he will send an angel. He, she, whatever you believe in will send an angel. That angel may have skin on. That major, angel may have fur on, feathers on, or scales on. In fact, in that same trip in Australia, I was once again feeling sorry for myself because everybody else can drink. And I kayaked really far out, almost that far, and they couldn't even see the island. And I just started yelling to God going, do you even hear me? Do you, uh, do you even exist? And a huge manta ray, about five feet in diameter, jumped right next to me. And I went, OK, I got the picture. You were there. And I went, OK, I got it. Thank you. Thank God it wasn't a great white shark. Yeah, that's all I can say. And it's interesting, because because I haven't been blowing money on alcohol, and which led to drugs, and which led to eating a lot of food and throwing up, and treatment centers and emergency rooms and detox centers. And anyway, I'm able to save money. I've been to 28 countries. I've been to all seven continents. And the other day, I was just thinking how a lot of times we compare our insides to everybody else's outsides. And I started thinking it's kind of like how I went to Antarctica and it was so beautiful. And the little penguins are walking around. They have little, these th little things called penguin highways. And the penguins literally walk on it. And we have to walk to the side. And the penguins will walk right by us. But I realized, you know, in Alcoholics Anonymous, we have highways. The path that Bill and Bob already took before us. 
that shows us the way to be happy, joyous, and free. All we have to do is the steps. Get, you know, Cliff Notes of Alcoholics Anonymous. Don't drink, go to meetings, get a sponsor, work the steps, call three alcoholics, or be in contact with three alcoholics every day. And the interesting thing about Antarctica is it's so beautiful to look at. But God forbid you smell. Because there's penguin poop everywhere, and it smells so badly. I'm so grateful that when I sent postcards, it didn't say scratch and sniff, because it would have been very bad, and no one would ever go there again. I'm telling you. If anybody's been to La Jolla, where all the seals are, multiply that by 100. Anyway, and, and I've been to Thailand, where I got to feed tigers. And I'm telling you, each one of you in this room tonight, if you are here tonight, man, you are chosen by God. You are one of God's chosen people. Because we may be the only walking big book that people see out there. Believe it or not, people still, still think that Alcoholics or AA is an automobile association. People still don't know that AA exists. And the, thing, the crazy thing about it is when I came to these rooms, I hated myself so much. I was so messed up and so lost, and I hated myself that it didn't matter if you loved me and cared about me, because I was going to do something so stupid, whether it was get in my car and drive or try and go on the top of the car when you're driving the car. I mean, just stupid stuff to push you away. And if you loved me and cared about me, I thought there was something wrong with you. You see. I love the story in the big book about the Titanic because here we are, doesn't matter what we have in common, rich, poor, doesn't, black, white, Hispanic, doesn't matter. Once our butt hits that water, we all have something in common. That water is alcoholism, and the lifeboats are Alcoholics Anonymous. And you guys were throwing the, the life raft out to me saying, here, or the life ring saying, grab it. Grab it, and I'll pull you in. But because I'm so dramatic, I wanted you to jump in the water, put your arm around me, and bring me and put me in the boat yourself. I wanted you to do the work for me. And all I need to do is put my arm in that ring, and you guys would pull me in the boat. See, I, I can't work this for you, and you can't work it for me. It's kind of like eating. I can't go, oh, this is good. Isn't it good? And you don't, don't give you anything. You're sitting there going, oh, uh. you have to eat for yourself. You have to exercise for yourself. This program is something we do one day at a time. Yeah, and I'm really competitive, and I will be an athlete to the nth degree. And I realize competitivism, competitivism is also a character defect of mine, because I didn't know how to have fun. Now, this year I was voted Teacher of the Year because I know how to have fun. I know how to do crazy things with my students. I don't care if they know the rules. I don't care. All I care is they're moving back and having fun and enjoying themselves. You see, my brother is still a big-time wrestler, and there was a picture he posted on Facebook of a, pers a referee holding up the winner's arm. And he said, only a few people will get to know this, you know, victory. But you know what? Every day as an alcoholic, we do not pick up a drink. We get that victory. Every day we don't pick up a drink. We win the, gold se uh, the World Cup. We win the World Series. We win the Super Bowl. Every single day an alcoholic gets through the day without drinking. It is a victory. And you know, I never felt like I belonged anywhere. Never felt like I belonged in my family with four brothers. Never felt like I belonged on the football team. Never felt like I belonged on any of the sports teams. Definitely didn't feel like I belonged in any of the colleges. However, I'm lots of friends with people on Facebook that tell me they remember helping me. They remember bringing me back to the dorm drunk, and I just say, thank you. You know, I have to thank everybody out there for being there for me when I was in a blackout and that I didn't kill somebody or kill myself in a blackout. 
You see, this is a gift. This sobriety thing is a gift. It is priceless. And I challenge each and one, every one of you to go and learn how to love that person you're looking back at in the mirror. And I had a hard time with that, and somebody suggested to me, and this is just for me, find a picture of yourself when you were three and love that little boy or love, love that little girl that still lives inside of you. Because it doesn't matter if we're three or 103, we still have that little three-year-old child inside of us. And it doesn't matter if you're three or 103, dreams still come true. And you are never too old to manifest the dreams in your life. And as I was saying, I never felt like I belonged anywhere, but I do belong in the program in any room of Alcoholics Anonymous. I can go anywhere in the world and walk in the room and feel the feeling. In fact, I walked in rooms where I had no idea what they were saying because it was in another language, but I felt the feeling and I knew I was home. You see, you are God's chosen people. We are God's chosen people. We get to live two lifetimes in one lifetime. I am no longer the falling down drunk that likes to go for ambulance rides and end up in detox centers and treatment facilities. In fact, another God shot was in a detox center when my parents finally gave me the first time of tough love. They said, here's your stuff. We don't want, we don't want you unless you're going to decide to get better. And that was progress for my parents because my mom used to believe me when I said I, I wasn't drinking. I was just making out with a guy that was drinking. She believed that, you know. And so... Here I am, here I am in this detox center. They locked me in a room, it was a pad, basically because I was a threat to myself and I realized they left a belt in my suitcase. And I was getting ready to go in the shower and hang myself. Because I didn't want to live anymore. And my mom also brought a picture of my higher power in a bigger big book. And I felt my God say so strong in my spirit, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I am here for you. I love you. You will get through this. You know, that is just one of the times my God has come through for me. Another time I had relapsed with my eating, and I didn't want to live with my head in the toilet, because that would lead back to drinking. I held a loaded gun in my hand, put it in my mouth, put it against my head, put it underneath. And I felt God say so strongly in my spirit, if you do it, you're still going to live. You may be in a wheelchair for the rest of your life, but you're going to live because I have work for you to do. I put that gun down, and I picked up the phone, and I called a friend, and I cried, and I cried. Sometimes all we need is a good cry. They say, watch out for halt, hungry, angry, lonely, tired. Let me tell you, every time I relapse, I was in one of those. So I'm going to leave you with something that I have in a couple places in my house because I need to remember. I was regretting the past and fearing the future. And I heard my God say to me, when you're in the past with all its regret and shame, it is difficult. My name is not I was. And when you're in the future with all its anxieties and fears, it is difficult because my God says my name is not I will be. But when you're in this moment, this precious moment, it is not hard because my God says my name is I am. That's how we stay sober. One second at a time, one minute at a time, one hour, one day. And let me tell you something, fasten your seatbelt because you could have a life beyond, beyond your wildest dreams. And if you're down and out and having a hard time in sobriety right now, I want to tell you, it will pass. It will pass, I promise you. Suddenly the cancer can be gone. Suddenly the job you've been looking for can find, be, be found. Suddenly the, per the love of your life can come into your life. I remember, I'm still waiting for that. I remember I said, I said, I can't get sober. What about when I get married? And what about, you know, I'm going to want to drink champagne at the wedding. That still hasn't happened, so whatever. You know, it's like I'm still, yeah. 
But you know what? I'm happy. I'm happy, I'm happy, I'm happy. And I'm sober. And life was meant to be enjoyed, and enjoying life means making a decision to enjoy my life. I make a decision. I get to clean my house. I have a house to clean. I get to go to work. I have a job I get to go to. I get to, believe it or not, take a bath, because sometimes I'm like, I don't feel like it. You know, I get to do all this stuff. So if I could change my thinking about the everyday mundane things and be just excited to take out the trash as I am to go to a trip to Ohio, uh, Hawaii. <laughs> I almost said Ohio, but I guess that would be like taking out the trash. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> which is true because my relatives all still major in like the six major Bs. They're either drinking beer or booze, smoking basic cigarettes, playing bingo or bowling or making babies. So, you know, that's, that's all my relatives back in Ohio. <laughs> anyway, I mean, I love, I love Midwesterners, don't get me wrong. It's interesting though, I just want 